Ladies and gentlemen, a video message from the 14th Librarian of Congress, Carla Faden. Good evening, and thank you for joining the library on this special night for remembering Dennis Johnson, recipient of the 2017 Prize for American Fiction. I'm sorry I can't be there with you, but I know it will be a memorable conversation with these extraordinary authors. The Library of Congress honors a writer's lifetime achievement with the Fiction Prize at the National Book Festival each year. So I didn't want to miss the opportunity to share with you some news about this year's event on Saturday, September 1st. Once again, this celebration of books and reading will feature some of the biggest names in every genre. In history, I'm thrilled to announce that former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright will join us. Also, Doris Kearns Goodwin, John Meacham, and Ron Charnoff. Best-selling author Amy Tan will discuss her new memoir, Where the Past Begins. Dave Eggers, Jennifer Egan, and Isabel Allende will all be with us. And children's author and Pulitzer Prize winner Juno Diaz will join us. Our U.S. Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith and National Ambassador for Young People's Literature Jacqueline Woodson will be there too. This is just a hint at the things to come. More names will be announced soon. I hope to see you there. Please welcome the Director of National and International Outreach, Dr. Jane McAuliffe. Good evening, as you've just heard, I'm Jane McAuliffe, the Director of National and International Outreach here at the library. On behalf of all of my colleagues, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Stories from a Fallen World, the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction tribute to Dennis Johnson. Tonight is the third in what has become an annual celebration of the prize and its winners. And I know that we all find pleasure in the fact that in today's hectic world, we can pause and take an evening to recognize the power of literature to change our perceptions. Along with our poet laureate, the Prize for American Fiction stands as the library's highest honor to an American writer. It seeks to commend strong, unique, enduring voices who have told us something new about the American experience. Dennis Johnson certainly deserves the honor. As last year's prize winner, Marilyn Robinson, has said about him, I have never known a writer who was so identical with his work, whose thoughts and passions and energies were so entirely of one substance with the world he remade as fiction. The great energy of his imagination was a fusion of honesty and seriousness, pain and laughter. His life was a thing of moment and urgency, pure and undistracted. Dennis left us too soon, but we have an amazing group of his writing peers, literary and journalistic, here with us tonight to help celebrate his life and work. It should be a fascinating discussion that reflects in strikingly different ways the gritty themes that course through his stories. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize Cindy Johnson, Dennis's widow, and his daughter, Lana Burke. We're so very glad that you could join us this evening. I'd also like to recognize Avida Bashirad, deputy publisher of Random House, Random House is the proud publisher of Dennis's work. Now, please let me welcome my colleague, John Haskell, to the stage to tell you just a bit about one of our hosts this evening, the John W. Kluge Center here at the library. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and, and uh, thank you all for coming. The Kluge Center is proud uh, to be co-sponsor of this event. It, it's a continuation of a collaboration we've had with the Poetry and Literature Center to celebrate the winners in the Prize for American Fiction. Uh, the tribute to this particular literary giant 
fits perfectly into the Kluge Center's mission, which is to be a bridge between scholars and writers on the one hand and policymakers and the interested public on the other. And that's to foster a continuing conversation of the challenges facing democracies in the 21st century. Before we get to the program, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to the National Endowment for the Humanities, who has gotten the word out uh, to, uh, to a lot of you about this event, and also to thank them for the work they do in collaboration with the library. Um, right now, we have a brief video featuring Dennis Johnson. English words are like prisms, empty, nothing inside, and still they make rainbows. So says a character in Already Dead, a novel by the late, great American writer Dennis Johnson. Johnson's stories, as legions of his fans know, are also prisms. They are hard, merciless, flinty, and yet they too make rainbows. He's been called a writer's writer's writer, and for all the enigma of that string of words, they hold a simple truth. Those who bring language to life recognize Johnson's gifts instantly. Louis Erdrich calls his work profound and transcendent. Jonathan Franzen finds his sentences miracles of transparency and tone. Philip Roth calls him daring, terrifying, and an emissary for tortured, broken souls. Marilyn Robinson marvels that a writer's personal passions and energies can be so inextricably wedded to his words. All agree, Dennis Johnson has managed to give us minimalist, yet distinctly ecstatic and hallucinatory rainbow prose. He is an American original. He was born in 1949 in Munich, Germany, and raised in Tokyo and Manila, the child of American diplomats. As a teenager, moving back to Washington, D.C. during the tumultuous 60s, he came to know the country and the restless characters he would capture so vividly in his fiction. He graduated in English literature from the University of Iowa and earned an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, where he returned as a teacher. He has also taught at Texas State University and the University of Texas at Austin. In the course of his fevered career, he published novels, short stories, journalism, and poetry. Among his best-known works are those about the flotsam and jetsam of American life, The Laughing Monsters, Nobody Move, Tree of Smoke, Already Dead, Jesus' Son, Resuscitation of a Hanged Man, The Stars at Noon, Fiscadoro, Angels. He's received numerous awards for these, including a National Book Award, a Lannan Fellowship in Fiction, a Whiting Writers Award, and in 2008, he was named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Throughout, he has chronicled an America that has gone unobserved, unrecorded, here are our drug addicts, our war veterans, our disaffected, our used up and left behind. And yet the most affecting and rewarding aspect of Dennis Johnson's fiction is that in work after work, he has proved that beauty often lurks in unexpected places, that strength can be found in failure, that the human spirit is a fragile but resilient vessel. His is a very American story. He once described his works as pressure cookers of language, his characters as those who inhabit life's perilous edge. As time wore on, he found that he himself was all too vulnerable to these human frailties. When the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, offered Dennis Johnson the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction in March of 2017, he wrote in an email message, my head is spinning from such great news. Two months later, tragically, he was dead. The library is very proud to honor posthumously this extraordinary human being and writer whose contributions to the American canon have been lasting and invaluable. As the librarian wrote when the prize was announced in June 2017, Dennis Johnson was a writer for our times. In prose that fused grace with grit, he spun tale after tale about our walking wounded, the demons that haunt, the salvation we seek, we emerge from his imagined world with profound empathy, a different perspective, a little changed. We're very proud to count Dennis Johnson among the distinguished winners of the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marie Arana, and I have the privilege of serving as the literary advisor to the Library of Congress and to the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. One of my most rewarding responsibilities is directing the jury that governs this distinguished award, the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. In that capacity, I get to work with wonderful scholars like the ones you've just heard, Jane McAuliffe and John Haskell, as well as the head of the Poetry and Literature Center, Rob Casper, whom you'll meet at the end of the program. Every year, a jury of 27 distinguished literary critics, Nobel laureates in literature, Man Booker Award winners, former winners of this prize, put forward three American authors they think most deserving. The Librarian of Congress makes the final selection. The purpose of that award is spelled out on the back of your programs, is to commend strong, unique, enduring voices that throughout long consistently accomplished careers have told us something new about the American experience. Past awardees have been Herman Woke, Philip Roth, Isabel Allende, Don DeLillo, E.L. Doctorow, Louis Zerdrick, John Grisham, Marilyn Robinson, and Toni Morrison. The choice of our 10th prize winner, Dennis Johnson, made by Dr. Hayden in March of last year, and then confirmed in a prize ceremony in September, was especially thrilling for me as I've been a dedicated fan of Dennis's work since I stumbled onto Resuscitation of a Hanged Man back in the early 90s when I was a little younger than I am now and found myself bowled over by his language, its emotional force, its precision. As one reviewer wrote, quote, his novels, like poems, seem to be written line to line. Unquote. But the full power of his stories transcends even his considerable prose mastery. Dennis's stories land like a swift punch, somewhere between gut and heart. The last time I spoke to Dennis, it was on the phone, trying to persuade him to be here tonight. He had been so delighted by Dr. Hayden's call and the news that he was the chosen honoree. I exchanged emails with him just after that call. But he was also an immensely private man. He didn't like public expressions of admiration. Indeed, he had been conveniently away in some war zone reporting a story when the National Book Award was conferred on him 10 years before for his devastatingly powerful work, Tree of Smoke. I tried valiantly to argue my case that he should join us here, that he didn't need to do much. Just come, sit out there in the audience with all of you and be lauded and celebrated and given his due for being one of the great American literary figures of our time. He was polite, he was friendly, he let me talk and talk. That phone call, which lasted a good long while as I remember, and during which I felt with every passing minute that my powers of persuasion were failing me, ended with, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> he just couldn't bring himself to do it. That was on May 18th, 2017. Six days later, he was gone. Now we're here, gathering to honor him in his absence. Thinking about how to best to celebrate Dennis, we decided that what might please him most, given his gimlet-eyed view of public expressions of admiration, might be to turn our lights in the other direction. We decided to pay tribute to him by honoring others in his name, choosing three exemplary American writers whose works reflect in one way or another the themes that are so present in Dennis's work. They would be excellent writers at the top of their form, very different practitioners of the craft, three greats who, like Dennis, tell stories, fiction or nonfiction, 
excuse me, stories of a fallen world. The human costs of addiction, for instance. The terrible fog of war. The essential alienation and disconnectedness that define modern day America. If we do this right, tonight you'll see a little bit of Dennis and his obsessions in all three of these brilliant wordsmiths. I'd like to tell you something about each, uh, right up front, right here before we sit down, in reverse order of their appearance, so that when I actually bring them on, the last shall be the first. Let me start in that spirit with someone who will actually follow the writers. She is Elizabeth Cuthrell, a very accomplished film producer who wrote and produced the film version of Jesus' Son, that stark, searing, often funny, quirkily funny, collection of stories for which Dennis is probably best known. Elizabeth is co-founder of Even Star Films, an independent film and theater production company. She's turned out numerous prize-winning movies as well as acclaimed theater productions on both coasts. She also produced a stunning series of, of public service announcements called Stop the Hate, you're urging racial tolerance for which she won the Courage Award. We're especially thankful to, very grateful to Elizabeth for coming to share with us her long time friendship with Dennis Johnson. Sam Quinones is the author of Dreamland, a true masterpiece of investigative journalism about the opioid crisis and the widespread addiction that has ravaged small town America and the heartland. His book is powerful, absorbing, urgent, a monumental achievement that drills down on the harsh realities that Dennis described so memorably in fiction. The winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award, a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize, and named one of the best books of 2015, it's a book every American should read a book that tracks a spiraling drug trade of a racious, unfettered pharmaceutical industry and hundreds of thousands of lives strewn along the way. We're very lucky to have Sam with us tonight. Elliot Ackerman, a United States Marine, served five tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan and is the recipient of the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor, and the Purple Heart. His essays and short stories have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New Republic, among many others. His first book, Green on Blue, is a harrowing, brutal, utterly absorbing novel about an Afghan orphan trapped in the savage fog of war. Elliot's second novel, Dark at the Crossing, published just last year, is about a young Arab American caught in the Syrian conflagration. The novel was a finalist for the National Book Award and named one of the best books of 2017. He'll publish a new novel this fall called Waiting for Eden about an American veteran home from the war drastically damaged in mind, spirit, and body. Elliot, it's great to have you here. Jonathan Franzen, our first guest tonight, is renowned for plumbing the depths of the modern American psyche. He is a past master at the essential loneliness and anxiety that permeates contemporary life and the wild, careening twists of fate that can throw it all out of whack and send it spinning. John's talent for forming striking narratives out of ordinary life is abundantly evident in his work, most recently in his richly imagined novel, Purity, which has been called his most fleet-footed intimate novel yet. If some authors are masters of suspense, others postmodern verbal acrobats, Publishers Weekly wrote, and still others complex character pointillists, few excel in all three arenas. John is the author of four other novels, among them Freedom and The Corrections, for which he won a National Book Award and numerous other prizes and five works of nonfiction and translation. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Jonathan Franzen. So 
I'd like to start with a quote, John, if everyone can hear me. Can, we, can I be heard? Yes. Um, this is from Sam Tannenhouse at the New York Times. He said, Franzen cracks open the opaque shell of postmodernism, tweezes out its tangled circuitry, and inserts in its place the warm, beating heart of an authentic humanism. That was nice of Sam. <laughs> <laughs> he writes with equal fluency on equity finance, railroad engineering, currency manipulation in Eastern Europe, the neurochemistry of clinical depression, but the data flows through the arteries of narrative attending to the quiet drama of interior life and recording its fraught transactions with the public world. Now that is a pretty big, tall order. Um, John, you write about dysfunctional families, uh, small American worlds that are exploded really by large events. Um, I think I can summarize your work that way. And the humdrum of, of quiet lives that are suddenly ripped to shreds by foreign events or economic busts or missed communications or happenstance. What brings you to those subjects? <laughs> uh, sheer desperation. That's kind of what you face every morning in the office. Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'd, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I never do these things. Um, there's only one writer I would have um, done this for, and that's Dennis Johnson, because he has, uh, he has a unique place, actually, in uh, the world of American literature. Um, he's the one writer who every writer I know can quote multiple lines from verbatim. Um, they're often very funny lines, which is something I hope we don't lose sight of, is that Dennis is, was one of the funniest writers we had, um, laugh out loud funny, uh, precisely because he was so close to the edge. Um, so uh, it's, it's an honor to be here, and I'm so glad Cindy can be here too. Um, so, oh, yeah, my work. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, uh, it, it's autobiographical. It's just um, to get at the stuff that I'm interested in. I, I, I'm very bad at writing about myself. I think there are two kinds of writers, one who can pretty much only write about himself or herself, and then the, the other kind, and I'm the other kind. Um, and uh, I, I like a good story, um, and typically, Good stories are about characters who want stuff, um, and also if they're anxious, then the story might be funny. Uh, and if, if, I, if I'm not laughing, then I'm just setting those pages aside and trying something else. Uh, and, I, and I guess, yes, and I, I always paid attention to the news. I had a dad who was um, very attuned to um, he was just, he'd had no, he had no education really except as a, as a civil engineer, um, but he, he thought about stuff and, you know, dinner table conversation when I was growing up would be about what was happening in the world. So that just seemed natural and also it's nice if you have a character who wants something to put it, uh, put that character in a recognizable world and I, it doesn't seem, it just seems like, yeah, it's, it's what I do. Um, that was a sort of inarticulate response, but the articulate response would eat up the rest of our time. <laughs> well, you're, you're pretty articulate in, on the page, uh, John. Where it the, counts. <laughs> where it counts. The, um, it, but you, you, you really do, I think, uh, more than many uh, American writers who are dealing, uh, perhaps, with you know, um, plot-driven or, or um, shall we say, uh, small domest domestic uh, troubles. That there is a sense that there is a sense when you read uh, Jonathan Franzen that you are reading something about this anxious age, uh, yeah. something about a, a kind of uh, loss of connectivity that we've, that we seem to have come to. Um, at least that's what the critics say. What do you say from your perch? 
about what you're trying to do? Um, honestly, I am trying to be funny, uh, and, I, and I find people who are anxious very funny because I, I feel like it's the only way to survive my own anxiety is to step back and throw it into somebody else and then laugh at that person. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, like in, in the corrections, um, uh, I, I spent, so I'm always looking for a topic sentence. That's, this is a little craft thing. Um, I don't really have a character until I can write a good topic sentence about the character. It all goes back to what we were taught in seventh grade about topic sentences. Um, it turns out to be really, really true. Uh, and, it, and it can take up to five years to come up with a topic sentence for a character for me. <laughs> um, but there was a character in the corrections, Gary, who, um, and it was a rather elaborate topic sentence, but it basically had to do with, he had, there was all this attention in the 90s of, uh, on clinical depression, which uh, Prozac uh, was the, the miracle cure for. Um, and he, uh, he it basically, he was trying to demonstrate that he was not clinically, he was trying to do something in order to demonstrate to his wife that he was not clinically depressed. So that's, that was right very much of the time, and there were, people were having conversations, it beca it, instead of saying, I don't, I wish you would take the trash out, or I wish you would clean up after dinner more, they would say, you have a problem, you're clinically depressed. And then the other person would say, no, I'm not clinically depressed, you're clinically depressed. Uh, <laughs> and so it was uh, hilarious, but there were, those were real fights, um, and I had been in one myself. It was like... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it's like, okay, well, now, now I've kind of got a handle on this guy. Um, that, uh, and, 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 yes, it does, it does draw in what's happening in the world because um, why not? It's fun. Right, right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm an entertainer. So I'm looking for what's fun. So let me ask you now, I'm talking about real life, um, because one of the things that I, I think... Uh, would be really interesting to explore, particularly with your work, is the, is the way that um, fiction in some ways uh, gets across a reality better than sometimes nonfiction can. Um, what does fiction in your mind, what is it, what, how does it do that for a society? How does it feed us? How does it, how does it nurture us in that sense? Well, I actually think the people who read Dennis Johnson level fiction are the lucky ones. Um, and I don't mean economically the lucky ones, I mean just lucky that something is going right if you can actually sustain attention in a novel. If you're really, really miserable, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and in the prison population, there are the readers and those are the lucky ones. Um, in any population, I think it's, it's actually, uh, so if you, if you can enjoy a book, um, you should pause for a moment of gratitude that you're able to do that because a lot of people can't. If you can enjoy a complicated dark book um, that laughs at other things, at things other people might find terrible, um, then you're really, really lucky. But that, but that is actually almost a definition of, of what we call literature, is that kind of cosmic distance on stuff. If you're really down in the trenches, you can't do that. Uh, Oh, yeah, so I, um, I, I think of, I, I talk a lot about the metamorphosis, Kafka's novel about Gregor Samsa, uh, who wakes up one morning and finds that he's an insect. He could have done a, a memoir, um, sort of mid, midstream memoirs, talking about how crappy it was to live at home with his parents and not even have the good bedroom, even though he was the son and so forth. Um, <laughs> And this is a grown man, you know, he's been working a job for years, and there he is at home with the parents. And he could have probably gotten across some of why he found that a drag. Right. But to get at really the, the degree to which he experienced that as unbelievably terrible, um, he, he made up a story, he invented something. And, and also in the, in the process, Good thing for fiction, he protected his family because <laughs> everyone knew that the Kafkas did not have a large bug for a son. <laughs> so they, and 
And the parents themselves say, oh, that's not us. <laughs> How could that be us? <laughs> Franz is a little weird, but he's not an insect. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I think that broadly speaking, that's a metaphor for what fiction does, is it, it, it enables you to, to go, to exaggerate in these wild ways that, um, that mere representation of reality is, cannot, to, to states of mind, states, emotional states, um, and lots of other kinds of states uh, that mere factual representation simply cannot. Yeah. Um, of course, that brings me, you, you, you're, you're talking about uh, the, you know, the, the, the ways that fiction works. I mean, the humor in fiction, and, uh, which, which Dennis used so superbly in the middle of the darkest, the sort of funkiest moments, uh, it would, you would find it uh, screamingly funny. His word choice in a fatal accident of the first story in Jesus' Son, even the, um, I think, I think the, when, when, the, when the car crash happens, um, the woman says, no, the woman said viciously, like that word viciously, mm -hmm. um, which is like a head-on crash is about to occur. Um, yeah, that's, that tells me he had resolved something and could see it from the kind of perspective in which things, on the one hand, he's sort of touching close to God, and on the other hand, he's touching, he's, it's, it's all hilarious. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you get the new story collection for no other reason, there's a two and a half page scene of uh, the narrator uh, having a knee examination of surgical theater while tripping on LSD that... <laughs> if there's any doubt that he's, he was a comic writer. Yeah, there's yeah. A, there's a, in fact, you, you, you made a wonderful citation at his uh, prize ceremony, and um, I want to read at least part of it. You said, uh, his sentences at best are miracles of transparency and tone, which we've already heard. Perfect in the way they inhabit the page, but devoid of vanity about their perfection. Always vivid in their reference to the actual, but also always conveying something larger. Their creator's own self-knowledge and compassion and sense of cosmic comedy. The God I want to believe in has a voice like Johnson's. Right. What is, th yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Stress on want to, um, <clears throat> as in wish I could. Um, but yeah, if, I mean, if, if there were a God who spoke like, you know, in, with that kind of... Uh, I'm not going to try to explicate that sentence. Okay. <laughs> well, I think what it meant... Uh, oh, is... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> If I may. <laughs> you absolutely may. <laughs> <laughs> Is that he really had a voice. I mean, a very strong voice. And it was, uh, it, it, if, if, if we could put a, if we could pinpoint that talent, it would be that, that voice that he had that was absolutely uh, unique and original, as yours is, I would say. Um, oh, that, well, thank you. that sense that, that sense that um, um, you are in the hands of a really superb narrator and you can't quite let go. It's mesmerizing, that voice. Well, thank you. Is that you. what you meant? Um, <laughs> no, I was not talking about myself. I was talking about Dennis. <laughs> but... Um, Uh, there, I, I, I thought actually Marilyn um, put it nicely that there was there is a sense of a kind of unitary that that what he was that the writing and the and the person were almost indistinguishable. Um, it strikes me, uh, and I think our, our the other two guests who will soon join me um, uh, can speak to this. It, it, he is somebody who might very well not have survived. Um, he was a he was a kind of messed up kid um, and had intimate knowledge with these, you know, pretty violent uh, and definitely addictive situations. And um, there, is a, there is a sense of 
at the core, I think, of all of his, I, I was rereading the new stories on the way down here, and what, what is, what, the whole book kind of feels like a meditation, not a meditation, it's, it's a representation of the amazingness of still being alive, so that there's something about everything he wrote that is aware of the proximity of death, um, and that, that goes to, uh, in that respect, there's a, I think there's a kind of subterranean connection with Flannery O'Connor, um, who uh, in her, the greatest of all her great stories, Good Man is Hard to Find, um, she would have been a good woman if it had been somebody there to shoot her every day of her life. Um, about the grandmother in that story. If you don't know the story, go read it. Um, which is basically, this is, a, this is a trivial woman who, with a gun pointed at her, suddenly found something. And somehow, throughout his career, he managed to write the stuff that felt right on that bubble of, there's a gun pointed at me. Death is all around me. I've seen people die. I'm aware that I'm going to die. And, yeah, there's a line in the new book, um, you know, I like my wife, she's, you know, clever and rather attractive, um, she could die any minute. Uh, and that, he just says that, it's like, and then new paragraph, and we're on to the rest of the story. But that's, that seemed to me kind of the essence of the work, that's why, what makes it so exciting is that there's always death right there. Right there. Yeah, yep. right there. Well, with death right there, let's bring on Elliot Ackerman. <laughs> so here's a quote. So that might be my favorite introduction. Right. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's a quote to accompany you, um, to have you accompany us as, as, I, as I did for John. Um, this is from Ben Fountain, uh, who wrote uh, a wonderful book called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, if you know it. And he wrote about Elliot this. Thank you. Dark at the Crossing is every bit as taut and harrowing as the place it depicts, a region where 15 years of relentless war play out in filthy refugee camps and upscale shopping malls. Elliot Ackerman has written a brilliant, admirably merciless novel of broken lives, broken places, and good intentions gone awry. Someone once said of you, um, if I remember this correctly, that um, they, they don't award medals of valor for writing, but maybe they should to you. Um, there's a sense, um, Elliot, in your books, both of them, that you have emerged from the cauldron of hell to tell the story. Um, how, and this is, gonna, this is gonna make John's blood pressure rise because I read somewhere that he hates this question, but I'm gonna ask this question. How autobiographical um, are these stories in the sense that you have lived through any, uh, of course you've lived through, through, through the hell of war, but to what extent are well, these from life? I mean, you know, my, my first book is, uh, is the story of an Afghan who's murdered by an American, but it's all told from the perspective of the Afghan, so that's not me. Um, and you know, my, my second novel takes place in you know, southern Turkey around the Syrian Civil War, and it's a love story, but those characters aren't me. However, they're deeply uh, informed by my experience, and I don't think I could extricate my experiences from the book. Right. But there's a, there, there is a sense, um, I think, it's especially in Green on Blue, um, it, that you are, you're n not sure what side is which. It reminds me of revolutions in which the sides keep changing all the time because people see the battle's going this way, the battle's going that way, and they're going to run to whatever side is winning. There's that, there's a, a, uh, that sense of um, divided loyalties or confused loyalties, and the fog of it all, in a sense. Um, then, and that's clearly something that you've seen. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I've seen. It's something that I admire, you know, in, uh, you know, in other people's writing. It's something I admire in Dennis Johnson's writing. You know, the ability to take extremely complex 
political events and make them feel extremely personal. And I think it's something that, that fiction does. Um, but then you get, a, you know, we're talking about like, you know, different sides of an issue, you know, in a war. Like, for instance, there's the, um, what's the trope I someone just said to me the other day, which is, you know, you, I maybe I said on television, you, know, you don't really know a person until you've been divorced from them. Uh -huh. Which I think is, you know, like, that's, that's probably true. That's right. You know, I would append to that. You know, you don't really know a person until you've, you know, fought on the opposite side of a war from them. And so I think there's sort of, uh, you know, sometimes we'll see, you know, it's, you know, why are you so, you know, fascinated by the people on, you know, on the other sides of these conflicts? Well, in some ways, they're the people that you know the best. And to, you know, trot out another tire trope, you know, write what you know. Um, and, you know, and oftentimes, you know, you know them the best. Right. But I, I assume that in, in, in particularly in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, you are fighting alongside people who, um, who are of that land and with whom you have, to, um, you have to make bonds. I mean, there were one, one thing I think that you've said so eloquently is that a Marine is trained to kill, right? But he also has to be trained to love. And why? Because he has to throw himself in the line of fire for his buddy, for his uh, compatriot, for the person he's, he's, he's um, fighting with. Um, and that really interests me, that notion of, uh, you know, you're, you're essentially falling in love with or loving a person who whose life is at risk and who may, who will die or may die. Yeah, I think it gets to sort of the, the topic of our panel here and what is very unique in Johnson's work is that he right. is so often, you know, the edge, or I would say it's also almost like this extremely thin membrane that is translucent when you're standing there right up against uh, you know, issues, particularly issues of conflict, you know, and wars, so people are fascinated by that subject is, you know, the difference between, you know, love and violence um, is so permeable. And so, I mean, I found in my own experience, I have found in my own experience in war, I mean, some of the, you know, some of the great ironies is that, you know, people, you know, are doing very, very courageous things because they love one another, but the courageous things that they're doing are incredibly violent. Um, and so, um, so again, you're constantly, you know, Flipping, you know, we were permeating that membrane. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of membranes, the darkness at uh, the crossing um, deals with an, uh, 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 an Iraqi who's actually uh, born in Iraq, but he's an American citizen. And um, we can't help but wonder as we read it, and he wonders it himself, where his loyalties lie and uh, what it means to be true to oneself when you have two identities at work, two nationalities at work, two, you know, uh, loyalties. Um, and how did you get to that subject? And how, how, how does that, how did that come yeah. to you? Well, you know, this character who's an Arab American basically decides he wants to go cross into uh, Syria to, to fight for uh, the Free Syrian Army. And a lot of the book is about unpacking his motivations and actually kind of gets to what John was just saying with the Flannery O'Connor story, about needing the gun pointed at your head, which also reminds me of the great scene in Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket about Animal Mother, the machine gunner in the Marine platoon. They say, you know, Animal Mother's a great guy. He just needs someone to throw hand grenades at him for the rest of his life. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, this character, Harris Abadi, is kind of the, he's in the same position, but you know, and to be honest with you, the, the thing that was foremost in my mind wasn't anything that happened to me in the wars. It was actually um, the scene in Anna Karenina, and the way Anna Karenina ends. And so, um, anyway, spoiler alert, she throws herself in front of a train and commits suicide. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I always felt like reading that book and getting taught that, like, you know, Vronsky, her lover, kind of gets like a bad rap. I feel like, you know, like the world's been tough on Vronsky. And if you recall, the last you ever hear of Vronsky, he's been disgraced, he's an outcast from society now, but the last we hear is like, you don't even see Vronsky, you don't, you don't see Vronsky, you're just told by another character that Vronsky was last seen on a train heading to the Caucasus to rejoin his regiment. And they don't say why, and of course, you know, he's on a train and it just threw herself in front of a train. And, you know, Tolstoy doesn't tell you the reasons. But it always fascinated me is, you know, 
he could be going to rejoin his regiment because he thinks that some, you know, battlefield heroics will be the way he can redeem himself and integrate again into society. Okay, or he could be going there to basically, be, he could be on that train for the same reasons, you know, as how Anna ended herself. He could be going off the war to kill himself. And you don't know and you never get the answer from Tolstoy. Um, and, you know, I have always been fascinated that how, you know, people can engage in one act, people can go to war for completely different, you know, for reasons they don't even know to themselves. And it can be an act, a redemptive act, or it can be a destructive act. Um, so that's something, you know, that, that I was hoping to examine. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, you, you as, as, as Dennis did in, in Tree of Smoke, that, that sense of, you know, the, the, um, the complete um, sort of uh, suspension in a kind of wild card situation. Um, it, well, and like in Angels, you know, which is one of my favorite books of his, I, you know, you have this sort of like kind of it's not banal, but it seems very everyday. It opens on a bus. I mean, you know, there's a guy, you know, is right. meeting a woman on a bus. She's got her kid. You know, and by the, you get to the end of it, you're in, you know, in the middle of a bank robbery. Mm -hmm. And the way he could just sort of slip you from the banal into the very, very violent and put you in situations you kind of can't imagine that you're in, you know, I think was the wonderful thing he did in his work and I aspired to do in my work, particularly when you're dealing with violence, because the thing we often forget about violence is it is. It is so banal. The dealing with violence, it seems to me, um, you know, the, 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 it's so physical, it's so concrete, and it's, it's, it's all around you, and yet, um, and you deal with these war situations. But you also said at one point, Elliot, um, you, you quote, actually quote Faulkner, um, in which you say the only, uh, he said, the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself that being the conflict, not being the conflict that's around you concretely and, and p possibly threatening your life. Uh, it seems what interests you more is the internal conflict that is going on, even as that conflict is happening. Well, I think it's the thing that just, I think, interests most people. Um, I mean, characters are interesting. It's, you know, it's once you start getting into, you know, you were talking before about, you know, what does fiction do? I mean, you know, fiction takes you into the internal lives of these people, and I think that's, you know, that's where, you know, that's where the most compelling stories arise, you know, and that's where, you know, the, the emotion exists. Um, and, you know, why write fiction? I think, you know, if you are able to make someone feel something, you know, they'll remember what they felt in a way they might not, you know, remember what they read in the paper that morning. Mm -hmm. um, one last question for you, and that is, you're a warrior, um, you... Uh, I'm on my good days. Uh, <laughs> and... You know, warriors come home, uh, and things happen. And uh, do do we? And I'm I'm trying to take this out to um, to a, a a more social or uh, political question, if you will. Um, why do we revere warriors? I mean, we revere warriors from afar. When they come home, when they are riddled with problems, when you know they may be um, addicted to drugs or 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 uh, beating their wives or you know the female beating her husbands or not being good to the children, how why is it that we're not so good at confronting those issues that they bring home? Well, I think in some respects it's easy, you know, at that point to look at them as the other. Um, you know, I've often, and I think probably most people who, who have my background have had the experience of, you know, someone saying to them, like, you know, I could never imagine what you went through. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, you can. Make sure you can. Like, you know, you can, you've, maybe you've, like, passed by a car accident or, you know, you've lost someone in your own family. But I think at the same time, like, saying I can never imagine what you went through, it, like, always has unsettled me. Um, not only because it kind of shows, like, a, you know, like, because it, it puts up some, like, l lack of you know, empathy. It's like, if you can never imagine what I went through or what someone went through in this, and what you're basically saying is that like, I have been so inalterably changed or one has been so inalterably changed by an experience that uh, you can no longer identify with them. It's like, so if you can't understand what I went through, it means I've been so inalterably changed that I can never go back to being the person I was before I left. Mm -hmm. If I can never go back to being the person I was before I left, it in effect means I can never come home. 
Um, right. And that's, you know, and that's, you know, that's, a, that's somewhere we, we just yeah. can't be. Right. So, um, so I think that, uh, you know, that, that uh, maybe the answer to your question is, you know, just yeah. a general lack of empathy and a lack of being able to, you know, see ourselves collectively, uh, you know, in these wars. Right, right. Uh, and with that, I want to bring on um, uh, Sam Quinones, who um, deals with issues of and, and here's what I want to read about Sam. This was written by, by Laura Miller at Slate. Uh, Many nonfiction books are padded magazine features, but Dreamland, the three-pronged story of how heroin addiction become, became epidemic in small-town America, is the book Quinones had to quit his job at the LA Times to write. You won't find the story better told anywhere else, from the economic hollowing out of the middle class to the greedy, reckless marketing of pharmaceutical opiates to the remarkable entrepreneurial industry of the residents of the obscure Mexican state of Nayarit. All of these factors combine to create an opiate-addicted population in small American cities like Portsmouth, Ohio, where residents priced out of pill mills turn to a new and newly cheap high Dreamland, true crime, sociology, and expose illuminates a catastrophe unfolding all around us right now. Um, Sam, you've covered the border, you've covered the US-Mexico relations, you've been uh, a Latin American correspondent for, for many, many years. Um, at what point did the opioid crisis get your attention? Uh, well, I, I began a story about uh, when I was at the LA Times um, about a, a small town in Mexico where everybody comes to the United States to sell uh, heroin like pizza. Mm -hmm. So there's a delivery system where you call a number and then the, the, the operator takes your order and then dispatches someone to, to meet you. And it's, a, it's basically Domino's pizza of, of heroin. Um, and I, I came upon it when I was talking with a guy from the DEA in Columbus who said, you know, um, we've got this system here, we've got these guys doing this, we've never seen this before, no guns, they don't use guns, they're, they're, uh, they're uh, um, and we can't arrest them, we can arrest them, we arrest them, they send up more people, they reconstitute like, a, like a, some kind of mutant um, very quickly. And he said, um, they're all from the same town. And that, uh, I had written, I had lived in Mexico for 10 years, and I had written a lot about, you see this a lot in, across Mexico, where towns have, where one towns where people do one job. Um, and, and there's one town in my first book where everybody in the town makes uh, popsicles. Uh, one of the great businesses, uh, middle, uh, businesses for arriving at the middle class in Mexico is the popsicle business, and there's a, business, if you know Mexico, you know Paleteria La Michoacana is everywhere, and uh, um, that's one town started that, and, and you go to the town, and there's a, uh, in the front of the town, there's a two-story concrete popsicle statue saying thank you to the popsicle for bringing them into the middle class. So when he told me that, I knew he was right. I knew there had to be a town out there. He didn't know which one. He said it was Tepic, Nayarit. I knew it was not Tepic. Tepic is a capital city, the 350,000 people of the state of Nayarit. I knew that could not be true. It had to be a small town, so I began to write to, to guys he had arrested in around federal prison, and one after another, I wrote 20, 30 letters to these guys, hey, do you want to talk about your pizza heroin system? You know, basically, <laughs> is what I did. And uh, one guy, one guy kind of got back to me and says, yeah, we're not from Tepic, we're from a little town called Jalisco, where we all are heroin traffickers, and I thought at the time it was just um, um, uh, 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 Columbus, because that's where I first encountered this. And then he began to say, oh, no, no, we're all over the country. And I could not explain uh, a few things by the, about that. First of all, uh, they, they sold black tar heroin. And my understanding, my knowledge of black tar heroin was fairly extensive at that point. And black tar heroin was really, for many years, only on the western side of the United States. What, and now they were selling in Columbus and really in West Virginia and places in T Tennessee, places like that. And he began to say, tell all the cities where they were located now. And they had moved to Charlotte and they had moved to Lexington and Cincinnati and Memphis and Nashville, Indianapolis, et cetera, et cetera. All these different towns on the eastern side 
of, of the United States. I could not explain why that would be that heroin traffickers would have such big business, and, uh, such a new market. I thought heroin was this old thing that no one really messed with anymore. Everybody knew it was a disaster. So why would you actually mess around with, with heroin? Why would there be new, huge new numbers of people buying this drug and, and using and using this drug, and, and that's really what got me onto the larger story, which is the pain pills and the opioids as we know them uh, 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 today. But it was really an attempt to understand why, why Mexican heroin traffickers, particularly from this one town where I went, I interviewed eventually a dozen or so, maybe 10 or 12 guys who were traffickers who were all in federal prison uh, from this town. And it was a way, but, but I, I understood them to be the vanguard um, of this, that they, they were, they were the, f the, the, the spear really under, uh, 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 finding the market that was then going to explode, which has now happened. But they, were, they found this market, they knew what was going to happen back in 1998, 99, 2000, what's happening today all across the country, basically. Could you tell us a little bit about the scale? You testified in Congress not long ago, um, and I watched the whole hearing. It was absolutely fascinating, and, and I recommend it. Um, opioids kill people every day um, in a scale, I think you said in the hearing that more people are killed by opiates than by car accidents in this yes. country. Tell right. us about the scale that we're talking about, the scale. Uh, the scale mm -hmm. um, is, is quite, um, Stunning, I think. Yes, I mean, it, it must have been one of the great moments or the fascinating moments I, I describe in my book is when two public health um, folks from the state of Ohio realize that there is about to be a historic shift. For, since in modern America, the automobile has always been the leading cause of accidental death. There has never been a time when, and now, of course, that's gotten better you know, we've gotten more, we've gotten safer, you know, better cars, et cetera. So that number was coming down. But in 2007, two public health people at the state of Ohio figured out that that was going to end and that there was now in the state of Ohio first um, that overdoses mostly to narcotic pain pills, but to some degree heroin at that point, uh, was uh, overtaking and was going to be the number one cause of death. And that wasn't true in Ohio in 2007, and then it was true nationally the next year. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a stunning thing. I think it's also very much an undercount um, uh, because uh, this story begins and is most intensely felt in states with too many counties. And too many counties, like uh, Kentucky has 120 counties for 4 million people. Ohio, Ohio has 88 counties for 11 million people. Uh, West Virginia has a, a, a 55 counties for less than 2 million people. And the reason that's important is because this is not like, I was a crime reporter, started my career in the crack days. And crack was very public. Everything about it was public. You couldn't avoid it. It was on the streets, the drive-by shootings, the gangs were going very wealthy and, and, and violent and armed. Um, and, and it, you know, homicide rates went up, and the violence was horrible, and it destroyed neighborhoods, and none of that was happening with this. In fact, crime rates were dropping as, o as overdose rates were, also, were, 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 were rising. And so you have this, this kind of transformation of, the, of, of, of what you normally think of. It's very quiet, right? Uh, the doctors were the, were the source of supply. I mean, this really starts with narcotic painkillers. Not heroin, the, the traffickers come later. So it's really a source of supplies, doctors, pharmaceutical companies, American patients demanding to be fixed, in a sense. And so, um, and, and at the same time, you have parents and families wanting to hide the fact that their kids are addicted. Nobody wants to be recognizing that. The, the obituaries are almost all fabrications. And so, on. so the only place you're going to find this, the place where we're going to recognize this, is the coroner's office, bodies. But the problem is, in these small counties, in these states with too, few, too many counties, the counties are, are, we fund coroner's offices, erroneously, mistakenly, I believe, uh, based on, on county tax base. And so these coroner's offices are small, they're underfunded frequently, they don't have enough doctors in these areas, um, and they have, they're, they're, they're susceptible to family influence. So, um, you know, doc, don't tell, don't put that in the, in the death report because um, it's going to look bad for my, my dad or my brother or my, my, my child or what have you. 
And so um, what's happening today is really, I believe, uh, like a, a, uh, an enormous plague uh, across the country, certainly in large parts of the country, it's very, very intensely felt, um, that is, that is um, consuming families, consuming neighborhoods, consuming football teams. Football is really basically now a, a, a gateway to heroin addiction in America, in my opinion. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, and it's also destroying those areas that, uh, in order for those areas to be great again, a lot of these areas, they have to uh, d defeat this problem because not, nobody is actually going to go put a factory in some areas where half the population can't pass a drug test. You know? And so it's, the effect is, is massive, and it's, and it's, but, un, but also for a long time it really unseen. When, when my book came out, um, the uh, uh, health policy advisor for Hillary Clinton called me and uh, said, Hillary is stunned, this is 2015, uh, she's, in Ohio, she's in Iowa and she's in New Hampshire and she's stunned by the ferocity with which she is seeing parents come to her and say, we need a solution. They didn't care about almost anything else, mm -hmm. right? And I said, yes, because uh, first of all, this is a, this is the, a, a topic that polls poorly. You're never gonna get somebody to admit on the phone that this is their most important subject, right? Uh, they wanna hide it, but um, go out there, hug people, be a mother, to people, they need that, and you know, um, uh, there are probably a lot of reasons she lost, but but she, to that, she wrote a post policy position paper, mm -hmm. and that was, you know. So I, I, my feeling is this is a, a very hidden, even today, even though the, the awareness is much greater than it ever has been, even today, it's still uh, it's, we're seeing the these t these icebergs, and really down below is a massive, massive issue that's everywhere in the country. Um, veterans in pain, or people in uh, uh, the recreational as well. I mean, it's, it, it seems to do the gamut, the spectrum. Right, but it's of. all yes, sure, but it's all all connected to this idea that took hold in the mid 1990s, that um, promoted by pain specialists and by pharmaceutical companies, and really eagerly accepted by us, American pain uh, health consumers that narcotic painkillers were now known to be virtually non-addictive when used to treat pain. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the corollary, the damaging, the dangerous corollary to all that was, it doesn't matter how many of these pills you get prescribed. And you, you probably have gone, many of you I'm sure have gone, and for a surgery, the pain for which is going to last, what, two or three days, you get 30 days worth of pills, right? Well, you multiply that by millions of Americans every year for 20 years, and what you get is a massive supply that has created, a, therefore, a massive black market. And so you get kids going to parties and saying, hey, the, the quarterback is, and the high school football team has taken them, so, well, damn, I'll take them. I mean, most of the addiction is, is related, in my opinion, to supply. I used to believe that, that, that our addiction problems were due to demand. That, and when you're in Mexico, it's nice to believe that. Mexicans want to believe that. It's helps them kind of wash their hands of our binational drug problem. Well, it's those gringos up there, they just want their dope. Well, the truth is not that. I, I, was, I was convinced that when I was living in Mexico, now I, I'm not. I, I, I convinc I'm convinced now that it's a supply uh, issue and most drug problems are. You unleash a, a, a vast, people come to me and say, should we legalize drugs? I you read this book and I'm like, well, what about this story makes you believe we ought to legalize drugs? Yeah. All of this is due to legal drugs. You unleash a vast, vast, hyper, very potent supply of legal drugs on the, on the population, and, and you will get massive uh, 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 problems, you know? And it was a, it was a time of, of fantasy, you know? I often point out, these were years, too, when we believed that, that many, uh, we, we believed kind of, we were special and therefore the old rules don't apply to us, you know, and so uh, these were years, you know, when, when we believed it was very common for numerous baseball players to hit more than 60 home runs. It had happened twice, mm -hmm. you know, and it had not happened since they cracked down on steroids, right? Mm -hmm. We believe that if you package all these, all these um, non-performing nasty home loans into one security and standard and poor stamps, that thing, AAA, that's a magnificent place to, to, to put your money, and we believe that you massively prescribe um, uh, narcotics derived from the opium poppy, uh, that that would not create some, uh, uh, you know, an enormous new population 
uh, of drug addiction. Uh, and very much uh, unlike the subjects of Dennis John, these are, these are mainstream people. I had a drug addict tell me, dude, I stopped using. It was enough to get me to stop using to watch when the football players and the cheerleaders got addicted. Because he was a punk rocker. He didn't want to be, he, he went to heroin because it was like this outside kind of thing, rebel kind of thing. Now it's very much mainstream. This is uh, what I was going to uh, point out. In, in one of the short stories in Largesse of the Sea Maiden, which was just published uh, pom posthumously by, um, by Random House, uh, a wonderful book, absolutely marvelous book of short stories. In many ways, I think a culmination of, of Dennis's um, talent. He writes about a jailbird's ability to get high on the most unexpected of substances. Uh, at one point, um, somebody brings in a newspaper soaked in LSD, and everybody just thinks, well, that's a newspaper, except that it's, you know, it's satisfying. This is a very different thing that you're describing. This yeah. is not, this is, it's, no, this it's is, jumped this, a, it's jumped a, a This a, is almost entirely fence. white people. This is, um, it starts in Appalachia and the Rust Belt, which of course are areas we're, we're, um, we're very eager to ignore um, and did ignore. Um, but uh, by the time I got onto the story, really it had spread far, far beyond. It really had spread across America and had spread really stunningly, in my opinion, to some of the, the very nicest suburbs Orange County is like our heroin beltway in LA now, you know. Uh, some of the nicest suburbs where people had done best in the economic expansions of the previous, say, 20 or 30 years. It was in those areas, I've always thought it was stunning, that in those areas people are, were getting addicted and dying from drugs used to numb pain. Like you look at their lives and you go, like, what pain exactly do you feel? It is a perfect life. In the history of the world, point, Zero 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 one percent have lived as well, of the people ever to exist have lived as well as you, and you gotta uh, 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 you know use these use these drugs to. But but I mean I th I think that that's that's kind of the story that I I I initially believed that I was writing the great American drug trafficking story. I want to be a cr I was a crime reporter. That's really all I wanted to do. You know I want I write about Mexico and all the like crime and gangs all this stuff and. Uh, then I began to realize, no, that the, well, yes, this is certainly that story, but there's a whole lot more to it. There's, there's, there's this isolate, really what it comes down to is not economics. How do you say a Rust Belt town in Charlotte, North Carolina have the same problem and make it a, a, an economic, it's not an economic story. What it really has to do with, I believe, my common denominator, where the best I can come up with, is our own deep, deep and profound isolation and our destruction of community, which is why I chose um, uh, the, uh, this pool, swimming pool in a small town called Portsmouth, Ohio, on the, on the Ohio River, um, for the metaphor, really, over the, the, the central issue, it's a image of the, of the book. It, the name of the pool was Dreamland, and the pool was a place where everyone came together and, got, and, and grew up, and it was a steel mill and shoe factories and bustling Main Street and all that and 50,000 people, and the pool was where they all came together and formed community, and then of course the steel mill leaves, the, the, the shoe factories leave, the, uh, the, uh, the main street just empties out, classic fashion, half the town leaves, and then everyone retreats indoors and finally they can't sustain it and they dig up and destroy dreamland and replace it with a, with a strip mall uh, and an O'Reilly's auto parts store as the, as the, 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 the anchor tenant. And, uh, and then they become exposed, not unlike, uh, I believe, uh, the uh, uh, Indians when the, when the Europeans brought smallpox. You know, they, they, they just became, they had no bulwark, community bulwark to keep this at bay. And I think that that, that is um, what, we're, what we're dealing with now in a deeper sense, kind of uh, with, this, with this opioid epidemic that is, um, you know, coast to coast. This is what struck me about um, your hearing, and I want to bring John into this because um, you said in the hearing that it was at that point where you know families from all kinds of classes and, and uh, would get together and, and mix, and this was their you know the, the community coming together and a kind of a, a real connect, con connectedness there. Um, 
And so much of what John writes about is a kind of disconnected where you're reeling out of connection, really, because you know either um, your marriage is falling apart, um, your your the economy is, has has uh, gone bust, and you don't have a job in the in in, in the mining town. Um, so. My, my question is, um, <laughs> and this is a Pollyanna question, I, I uh, admit, fix the malaise, fix the problem, fix this dis disconnectedness, John, what do you think? And, and you start to war, because I think you actually said in the hearing, um, Sam, you said, you know, you've got to get back to that. You've got to get back to that connection. You've got to get back to yeah. that community. Uh, right. What do you think, John? Um, <clears throat> I, I, would, I would respectfully um, disagree that I write about dysfunctional families. I think, I think the dysfunctional <laughs> families are likely to be found yeah. where there is a substance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, in fact, write about highly functional families. The kids are all well taken care of. They're not dropped on their head. There are, in fact, no serious drug addictions. Um, and yeah, I'm an old leftist, and I actually think that, you know, it's just we've been ground between the twin grinding plates of consumerism and kind of, which is an atomizing force. It makes the individual consumer yeah. the most important thing. And in fact, I would actually flip it around and say the reason I'm writing about families is I think of the family as the one thing you can't, that the, no matter how hard the two plates grind, you can't actually dissolve the family bond. So if you're interested in psychological intensity in a novel, which is kind of catnip for me, um, you're, naturally you're naturally drawn to the family because that's like one of the few places you can find it. You're not gonna find it necessarily at the community level or even at the friendship level yeah, because yeah. of this. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think that this, and then of course, um, the corporate for pharmaceutical yeah. forces and, and then you know, all of those things you were mentioning and then the financial industry, the, the, the worst of capitalism is kind of piling on sure. to make these things worse. And I think heroin's interesting to me because it dawns on me that that is, kind of piggyback on what you're saying, is that that is, the, if you are a culture that believes that stuff will buy you happiness, well yep. then the final mm -hmm. stuff yep. that could potentially buy you happiness is uh, this cruddy stuff that you inject in your van. I mean, it's a final expression and you're of, on the that, of that philosophy of, of and, living. And you're on the hedonic treadmill. It's like you yeah, got, precisely. Okay, you it's know, you never say, really happiness. It, it's, you're never, yeah. Yeah, no, of there's course. Never and and it, 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 it makes you feel like uh, you've attained it for a moment until then you don't, you haven't attained it anymore. You gotta get back. And the, the, what, what I found interesting, frankly, was that the same guys, the Mexican guys I was writing about, they never used their dope. They, were, they would use cocaine, they would drink, but they never used their dope. Um, but they were also addicted. Uh, they were addicted to, as, as poor young men, leaving home. Uh, being poor in Mexico is not just about having not very much money, it's also being humiliated for not having very much money. Mm -hmm. They would come home with money, and that was their narcotic. They would, they would accumulate, um, one of the things that they loved to accumulate was Levi's 501 jeans, and, uh, because those were the classic, the, the, the rural gold standard for, for men, rural menswear in Mexico when I was there for sure was Levi's 501 jeans. They would bring them, and, and, and all the addicts would bring them, them jeans for their dopes, would trade them dope for the, the jeans for the dope. They'd take the dope, the jeans home and, turn, and, and, and give them away like Santa Claus. But the, all, the, all these guys who they'd grown up with, all the girls want to talk to them. All these men would come to them and ask for them, for loans, well, you don't get asked for a loan. That's a good thing. You don't get asked for loans unless you have money to be to be actually given. And so there's this there's this feeling throughout throughout the, the research that I had that everybody was kind of addicted to, uh, to to something, but it was not. They were looking for happiness, and the truth is, happiness doesn't. This is pleasure. Happiness doesn't come from that, but it's all that consumer culture mm -hmm. that you're referring to. I think a very very big part of our, our life, yeah. Yeah, it's almost like, uh, it, it, it actually is reminding me of, of something that Dennis wrote, that sort of vulture feeling, um, certainly. Uh, the, it, it's his journalism in Liberia. Thanks. Um, and he, I can't remember if this was for Esquire magazine or what it was for, 
But he was describing this tremendously uh, nightmarish war in which the, um, the dogs are looking very prosperous and the people are starving. And the reason why the dogs are looking so prosperous is of course because they're feeding on the corpses. Um, I don't know why, and it's a very, very dark uh, image. <laughs> Say that again. But it's a it, 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 it suggests to me, and, and, and um, uh, Elliot maybe can, can comment to this, uh, that it's, it's almost a metaphor that um, uh, in, in the consumer uh, business, and also you know, in, the, in the business of war, that um, uh, there, is, there are corpses all about, there are people dying. This is a, 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 a crisis that, I mean, I just, just, just in the newspaper today, um, this headline, nearly one million people, uh, nearly one million Americans are not working because they're too sick from op opioids. Um, last year it was 70,000 people dead. The year before that it was 64,000 people dead, more than the Vietnam War. Um, there is this sense of, you know, the, 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 the industry devouring, almost in, the, in a sort of warlike way, um, the, uh, these victims. And, and there seems to be a failure afoot of, uh, of responsibility in the sense that, well, I mean, what could we have done? Where could we stop it? What, what can we do now? Um, a little bit of a war scene, I would think. Elliot. Help us um, out here, Elliot. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think definitely, I think what you, I mean, you know, you know, wars build their own economies. I'm sure you've seen this in your reporting. And I think we have a conventionally American conception of war as though a war begins, it's fought for a cause, and then it ends, and somebody wins, and somebody loses. Well, you know, the, the reason we're in, a, in our 17th year for instance, of fighting in Afghanistan is not because we haven't found like that perfect bit of alchemy to you know, defeat the Taliban or whoever we've decided our enemy is. It's because you start to get into a cycle where the war just feeds upon itself. And why is it feeding upon itself? And you know, one part can be you know, the internal dynamics in Afghanistan or in Iraq and all of those reasons that we feel are very, very far away. But I think if we, you know, if we turn the light on ourselves, it's also because every war you go to you go to war with a construct. You know, whether it was the national mobilization that existed in the Second World War, where, you know, where the entire country got behind the effort, to you know, the draft of the Vietnam War, to today, where we are fighting wars that are resourced with an all-volunteer military, and they're funded through deficit spending. So kind of like you know, European right. killers, you right. don't feel a thing. And it goes on That's and on point. and on and on. Yeah. Um, Sam, is it? Is it your impression that the, the, the these are you say it's about supply? That seems to imply that these are these are people who, if they hadn't happened to have access to the opo opioids, yeah. they would have had good, successful, satisfying lives. Yeah, it's hard to say. You're right. You're, so I, don't know. I mean, because right. that I'm, yeah, when, yeah. When the mention of Afghanistan puts me, um, and there is this, as I said, there's this. We were talking backstage. There was an overlap between. Um, areas of certainly where the opioid crisis first made itself particularly visible and Trump America, that there is a, there's a kind of despair and a sort of let's just burn it all down quality and that's absolutely what happens if you tear up a country with 17 years of war. I mean, there's like, yeah. why not keep fighting? But there's also the sense in what you were talking about too, which was this, you know, this Fantasia that we're living in, where oh yes, we can have you know opioid drugs Everything, and, and be right. fine. But it's also the sense of you know, you know, oh yeah, we can hollow out our institutions and we'll all be psychologically okay. Like oh yeah, we can just you know resource our wars out to other people and not pay taxes on them. And yeah, that's going to work out fine. Like it's probably it was a good thing that we had a draft in the '60s. And it was, I totally agree with that. And then everybody you know got to a certain point. Like this is, makes no sense. We're not doing it anymore. And now right. you just. Yeah, Don't it's, it's exactly, oh, uh, 100 percent. I've said this, in fact, in my in talks that I've been giving around the country about this, that, that um, it's like, we, yeah, we just have this, like, it, it, the, whole, the whole theme, really, is, uh, uh, to me, I thought, again, it was drug trafficking, and that's not that. It's, it's uh, isolation uh, versus uh, community. You know, we used to treat pain 
in a variety of ways. One person would get a variety of approaches. So it would be, you have pain, chronic pain, well, cognitive behavioral therapy, diet, swimming, pain, marital counseling, you know, you need that, uh, the, the marriage of pain. So, um, <laughs> seriously, that's what they would, that's why you, part of what it was went into, but, but then we, the pills took up all the, we began to believe in easy answers to complicated mm -hmm. problems. We, we began to have, I told an audience the other day, I can't remember where it was now, that one of the worst things we ever did was um, go to war and then give, us, uh, give ourselves a tax cut. It's like we didn't really, this one infinitesimal part mm -hmm. of our population was going to ask to be go over there and risk their lives to fight our war, and we were not supposed to feel anything. We just all wanted to be narcotized. We all wanted to be kind of, immune and what's more very, very important in all this I believe very important is that we we were not asked to be accountable and not with pain either we were not asked to say uh, you know when you you have chronic pains uh, very often has to do with your own personal consumer decisions you don't get enough exercise you eat poorly you smoke you drink you, a variety of things doctors found the patients didn't want to hear that you know and so they just said you know, Doc, I'm not, I want you to fix me. I'm the, you're the car mechanic, my body's a car, fix me, you know. And we got into this attitude of, that I believe was also very kind of, just a narcotized attitude, that we don't want to have to deal with um, our, own, our own decisions. We don't, or, 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 or change our way uh, of, of living. And part of it was in, when we went to war and, and took, and, and were happy to get a tax cut. Uh, I mean, one of the lowest points in our culture, frankly, was right there. Uh, mm. Really, it was a bad, very sad day, I thought. Mm. Um, before we move on to the last segment of this program, I want to thank these extraordinary writers who, um, in one way or another, speak to, I think, uh, Dennis Johnson's work, his um, sort of uh, miraculous uh, ability to take so many themes that we've talked about here and merge them into um, ex the spectacular literature. Um, so thank you to Jonathan Franzen, thank you to Elliot Ackerman, thank you to Sam Quinones. Uh, before we move on to um, the next part of the program, the very tail end, um, thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. to, to um, tell us about the personal, more personal side of Dennis Johnson. I want to welcome Elizabeth uh, Cuthrell to come and talk about um, her personal recollections and her work uh, in film with Dennis. Elizabeth, please. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I think I'm going to usher in a, a different tone. I hope that's OK. Um, I first met Dennis in 1997 when my partners and I were writing the screenplay for Jesus Son. We were just starting out in the film business. It was our first project. I was a huge fan of Dennis's work, and I had somehow convinced him in a phone call to let us take a whack at the script. I promised him if he hated it, we wouldn't make the movie. And he knew I meant it. We sent him the first draft, he loved it, and asked to come to New York City to meet us. He ambled into the meeting wearing a vintage Aloha shirt, red cowboy boots, and Elvis Presley glasses held together in the middle by tape. I was terrified and thrilled to meet this genius whose book we were adapting. He seemed shy and amused at the same time, but what I remember most was his generosity. He marveled at our adaptation and talked to us like we were the geniuses and he was the kid just starting out. I asked him if he'd be willing to play a part in the film and he said, only if I can play Terrence Weber, the guy with the knife in his eye. He added, that way, if I hate the movie, I can use my performance as a metaphor. <laughs> so, 
A year later, we were on the film set together. Dennis was effusive. He kept saying, this is exactly what it looked like. This is exactly what it felt like. In the clip we're about to show you, Jack Black and Billy Crudup are working in the ER of a hospital. They've raided the medicine cabinet and they are hammered on a, just a cocktail of uppers and downers when a guy named Terrence Weber, played by Dennis Johnson, arrives. Here's the clip. I'd been working in the emergency ward for about three weeks, I guess. I'd taken the job because Michelle was pregnant and I was trying to be responsible. I had nothing to do on the overnight shift, so I went looking for Georgie, the orderly. He often stole pills from the cabinet. What am I gonna do about these fucking shoes, man? Uh, Whatever you stole, I guess you ate it already, right? Listen to how they squish. Mm. Uh-uh. Hmm? Uh, yeah. Let me just check your pockets, okay? All right. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Oh. Oh, yeah, I hear something. <laughs> yeah. I hope you didn't do this to him. Me? No, he was like this. My wife did it. Who brought you in? Nobody. I just walked down. It's only three blocks. All right, we, we better get you lying down. Okay. I feel ready for something like that. Name. Terrence Weber. Your face is dark. I can't see what you're saying. Georgie, what are you saying, man? I can't see. What? What's going on, Georgie? His face is dark. How long ago did this happen? Just a while ago. My wife did it. I was uh, peeping on the lady next door while she was bathing. My wife waited till I fell asleep, and then she decided she'd blind me. Do you want me to call the police? Uh... Not unless I die. Here's the situation. We, we need to get a team here, uh, an entire team. I, I want uh, a good eye man, uh, uh, the best eye man, a great eye man. I want a brain surgeon, and I want a really good gas man. Get me a, a genius. I, I'm not touching that head. I, I, we'll, we'll prep him, we'll prep this guy, and we'll just sit back and we'll sit tight. Right. Orderly. Orderly. Do you mean me? Should I get him prepped? Is this a hospital? Is this the emergency room? Is that the patient? Are you the orderly? Okay. Thank you. Uh, collaborating with Dennis on his stuff was like stepping into another world. Something in me would always get rearranged, open, challenged. We worked on a bunch of projects together over the years and were cooking up some new ideas right up until the end. Dennis was fierce about protecting his work. If someone tried to change or cut or wrongly interpret his writing, he would be crushed. But he would also do what he had to do to protect it. At a production of one of his plays in Chicago, he arrived for the final dress rehearsal and was stunned to realize the director decided to use this kind of sound machine to weave a creepy, weird background sound into the production. Dennis hated it. He spoke to the director and producer, but they wouldn't budge. So as a last desperate measure, that night after everyone had left, he snuck back into the theater 
stuck the sound machine under his jacket, went out and pitched it into the river. <laughs> Needless to say, he was locked out of the theater from then on. Uh, in his writing, Dennis could be merciless, but as a friend, he was profoundly kind. He saw into you, but he didn't judge you. And when you made a bad choice, he'd help you find something heroic about it. He was awake and aware, and in my opinion, hooked up to some sacred line. There were no layers on him. He felt everything, every infirmity, in detail and at the speed of light, and that can't be easy. But whenever I asked him how he was, he would always say, I'm getting better and better every day. And in one of our very last email exchanges, he wrote, I thought late life was supposed to be boring. I'm finding it more like a trip over Niagara Falls. He sometimes sent me emails that read like prayers. Here's one. Elizabeth, my darling sister, the other night I was up for a couple of hours around 2 AM. I call it the night watch. Sometimes it's the best part of the day. I had an insight that I wish I could have held on to, that everything is renewed, replenished, perpetually, and that's what we are, that replenishing. I'm not the one being renewed. I'm the renewing itself. I'm not the one being healed. I'm the process of healing. That's the true me. I felt it, this truth, vividly. I was living it for a little while. Now it's just a concept again, but a sweet one, and here I pass it on to you. Dennis's openness and sensitivity sometimes made it hard for him to deal with the rest of us, and especially the crazy business side of art. He told me when he was out in LA trying to get work made not long after Tree of Smoke came out, how he got a kick out of all the insane Hollywood bullshitters who would forget his name but proudly introduce him to each other as Dave and say, this is Dave, he won the National Book Award. <laughs> These kinds of experiences encouraged him to treat, retreat back to Idaho or Arizona and earn his reputation as being reclusive. But there was something about the process of making plays, screenplays, and teleplays that brought out a part of Dennis that was jazzed and collaborative and social and he couldn't stay away from. And he loved actors. He would sometimes go into ecstatic states, listening to them make sense of his work. Here's part of an email he wrote after a rehearsal. Elizabeth, what a privilege to sit in a room and watch these geniuses at work. Afterwards, they talk about their dinner plans, head for an hour's subway ride, go on as if it's possible to go on after an experience like that. I go back to the apartment, 10 minute walk, and try not to dissolve into the galaxies. Lastly, I want to talk just for a moment about Dennis's wife, Cindy Lee Johnson, because there's really no talking about Dennis without talking about Cindy. She was his beloved. And when he spoke about her and their kids, their beautiful daughter, Lana, who's here tonight, it was truly like he was channeling sunlight. Cindy took care of everything the world demanded of Dennis so he could make art. She was his buoy. Dennis could be impulsive with money, and he told me that once Cindy took over the checkbook, the repo man stopped coming for his car. <laughs> He'd always say, I don't know how she does it. Does she clip coupons, buy everything at a fire sale? She dazzled him. He never seemed to get over how her love transformed his life. Dennis would say things like, when Cindy goes somewhere, even for a short while, it's like God has died. This is my last story. I remember one afternoon when Dennis was giving a talk at the New School in New York City. It was a rare appearance, totally sold out, standing room only. It was raining and he got there late. Someone appeared and rushed him through a side door and up onto the stage and he got separated from Cindy. Another writer was introducing him and going on a bit long with accolades and I noticed Dennis on stage looking agitated. When he finally got to the mic, he put his hand to his forehead to shade the bright light, and the first thing he said was, Cindy Lee, honey, where are you? And she raised her arm and called back, I'm here. And he smiled his incredible boyish smile at the sound of her voice, and he said, I can't see you. Is your seat okay? 
where are you? Can you stand up? And she stood up and said, yes, I'm okay, I'm here. And they smiled at each other and flirted. And he said, all right then, and began to read a story. All right then, it is my great honor to introduce my precious friend, Cindy Lee Johnson. Good evening. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you to all the panel members. What a wonderfully unusual tribute. I love it. I also want to thank all the ladies and gentlemen of the Library of Congress for bestowing the esteemed prize for American fiction upon my beloved husband. He so richly deserves it. When I met Dennis, he was 39 years old and I immediately recognized him as the best looking man in the world. I fell in love straight away. Only later did I realize he was the best writer in the world, in my humble opinion. But he was also this brave pilgrim soul who traveled the planet from searching for pirates in the Sulu Sea to being the last American in Somalia when the UN withdrew. And consider this from a letter he wrote in 1991. Dear astronaut selection officer, I am a civilian who would like to be considered for the one-year astronaut training program. That's right. He tried to go into space. <laughs> he was like a modern-day Tom Sawyer. Often he would embark with just a fishing vest filled with everything he imagined he might need and a faith that he would encounter helpers, teachers, and guides along his path. And he always did. His life was a grand adventure. He loved this world. He loved his family. And he loved his work. I am so grateful to have his work. His light shines through in his writing. And it's a gift to the world. But oh, how I miss that man. I will always love him. And so to close, a slideshow. I believe it will bear out my best looking man in the world comment. <laughs> also, please keep an eye out for that fishing vest. Thank you. Born before the wind, also younger than the sun. And the bonnie boat was one as we sail into the mystic. Heart now hear the sailors cry. Smell the sea and feel the sky Let your soul and spirit fly into the mystic And where that foghorn blows I will be coming home Yeah, when the foghorn blows, I want to hear it. I don't have to fear it.
Where that fork home You know I will be coming home Yeah, when that fork horn whistle blows I gotta hear it I don't have to fear it And I wanna rock your gypsy soul Just like way back in the days of old And together we will fold And to the best day Come on, girl Thanks so much, Cindy, for helping us end this celebration on such a personal and powerful note. Uh, I'm Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the library. And I would like to call Cindy and Elizabeth and all of the participants uh, from tonight back out onto the stage. So please come on out, Cindy and Elizabeth. Please join me in thanking them again for an amazing, amazing night. Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, if you uh, want to leave with a few more books in your hand, our, our presenters will be signing books next door in the Whittall Pavilion. Uh, before you go to get uh, as many books as you can, though, we ask that you please fill out the survey that you got when you first walked in the door. You can drop them off in the back. Uh, we hope to see you here in just a few weeks' time for our Poet Laureate Spring event. Uh, until then, have a good night. And again, thank you for coming out. <laughs>